Shakespeare's Histories, The Queen's Storm, Episode 7. What began as a minor spat in a garden has detonated into civil war. Two houses of England's royal family fight for the throne. The factions are divided between King Henry VI, who is descended from Edward III's third son, and Richard Plantagenet, descended from his fourth son, but who also claims lineage through his mother to Edward's second son. The dispute spreads to the next generation as well, King Henry and Queen Margaret have a teenage son, Edward of Lancaster, the Prince of Wales. The Duke of York and his wife Cecily have four similarly aged sons, Edward, George, Richard, and Edmund. In the first skirmish at St. Albans, many key Lancastrian supporters were slain, including York's longtime rival, the Duchess Somerset. Her body was torn to pieces on the battlefield. York's son, Richard, carries her decapitated head as a trophy as the York family breaks into the palace at Westminster. <laughs> I wonder how the king escaped our hands. While we pursued the riders of the north, he slyly stole away and left his troops. Lord Clifford and Lord Stafford, all abreast, charged our main battle's front, and breaking in were by the swords of common soldiers slain. <laughs> <laughs> Lord Stafford's sister, Duchess Buckingham, is either slain or wounded dangerous. I cleft her beaver with a downright blow. <laughs> that this is true, father, behold her blood! Ah. And father, here's the Earl of Wiltshire's <laughs> blood! Ah. <laughs> Speak thou for me and tell them what I did! Oh! <laughs> Richard hath best deserved of all my sons! But is your grace dead, my lady Somerset? Such hope have all the line of John of Gaunt. Just do I hope to shake King Henry's head. And so do I, victorious Prince of York. (laughs) This is the palace of the fearful king, and this the regal seat. Possess it, York. York. For this is thine, and not King Henry's heirs. Assist me then, sweet Warwick. And I will! (laughs) York! 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 And when the king comes, offer him no violence, unless he seek to thrust you out perforce. The queen this day here holds her parliament, but little thinks we shall be of her counsel. (laughs) By words or blows... Here let us win our right. Neither the king nor they that love him best, the proudest bird that holds up Lancaster, dares stir a wing if Warwick shake her bells. <laughs> I'll plant Plantagenet. <laughs> Root him up, who dares! <laughs> Resolve thee, Richard. Claim the English crown. My lords, look where the sturdy rebel sits. Even in the chair of state... But like he means back by the power of Warwick, that false peer, to aspire unto the crown and reign as king. Earl of Northumberland, he slew thy father, and thine, Lady Clifford, and you have both vowed revenge on him, his sons, his favorites, and his friends. If I be not, heavens be revenged on me. The hope thereof makes Clifford mourn in steel. My gracious lord, here in the parliament let us assail the family of York. Far be the thought of this from Henry's heart to make a shambles of the parliament house. Cousin of Clifford, frowns, words, and threats shall be the war that Henry means to use. (laughs) Thou factious Duke of York, descend my throne and kneel for grace and mercy at my feet. I am thy sovereign. I am thine. (laughs) For shame, come down. He made thee Duke of York. It was my inheritance as the earldom was. Thy father was a traitor to the crown. Hastings, thou art a traitor to the crown in following this usurping Henry. Whom should she follow but her natural king? True, Clifford. And that's Richard, Duke of York. York! 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 Will you we show our title to the crown? If not, our swords shall plead it in the field. What title hast thou, traitor, to the crown? Thy father was as thou art, Duke of York. Thy grandfather, Roger Mortimer, Earl of March. 
I am the son of Henry V, who made the Dolphin and the French to stoop and seized upon their towns and provinces. Talk not of France, if thou hast lost it all. The Lord Protector lost it, and not I. When I was crowned, I was but nine months old. You're old enough now, and yet me thinks you lose. Father, tear the crown from the usurper's head. Sweet father, do so. Set it on your head. Let's fight it out, not stand caviling thus. Sons, peace. Peace thou, and give King Henry leave to speak. Think'st thou that I will leave my kingly throne wherein my grandsire and my father sat? No. First shall war unpeople this my realm. I and their colors, often born in France, and now in England to our hearts great sorrow shall be my winding sheet. Why faint you, lords? My title's good, and better far than his. Prove it, Henry, and thou shalt be king. Henry the Fourth, by conquest, got the crown. Twas by rebellion against his king. Yeah. I know not what to say. My title's weak. Tell me, may not a king adopt an heir? What then? And if he may, then am I lawful king? For Richard, in the view of many lords, resigned the crown to Henry IV, whose heir my father was, and I am his. He rose against him, being his sovereign, and made him to resign his crown perforce. Suppose, my lords, he did it unconstrained. Think you twere prejudicial to his crown? No, for he could not so resign his crown, but that the next heir should succeed and reign. Art thou against us, Lady Hastings? My conscience tells me he is lawful king. All will revolt from me and turn to him. Plantagenet! For all the claim thou layest, think not that Henry shall be so deposed. May that ground gape and swallow me alive, where I shall kneel to him that slew my father. Henry of Lancaster, resign thy crown. Do right unto this princely Duke of York. Or I will fill the house with armed guards, and over the chair of state where now he sits, write up his title with usurping blood. <laughs> My lady Warwick, hear me but one word. Hmm. Let me for this my lifetime reign as king. Confirm the crown to me and to mine heirs, and thou shalt reign in quiet whilst thou livest. I am content. <laughs> Richard Plantagenet, enjoy the kingdom after my decease. Yes! 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 What wrong is this unto the prince, yes! your son? <laughs> What good is this to England and himself? I cannot stay to hear these articles. Nor I. Come, cousin, let us tell the queen these news. Turn this way, Henry, and regard them not. Ugh, oh, Hastings. Why should you sigh, my lord? Not for myself, Lady Warwick, but my son, whom I unnaturally shall disinherit. But, be it as it may, I here entail the crown to thee and to thine heirs forever, conditionally that here thou take an oath to cease this civil war, and whilst I live, to honor me as thy king and sovereign, and neither by treason nor hostility to seek to put me down and reign thyself. This oath I willingly take and will perform. <laughs> Long live King Henry! Long live King Henry! <laughs> Plantagenet, embrace him. And long live thou and these thy forward sons. Now York and Lancaster are reconciled. Accursed be they that seek to make them foes. <laughs> <laughs> Farewell, my gracious lord, I'll to my castle. And I'll keep London with my soldiers. And I with grief and sorrow to the court. Here comes the queen, whose looks beray her anger. I'll steal away. Hastings, so will I. Nay, go not from me, I will follow thee. Be patient, gentle queen, and I will stay. Who can be patient in such extremes? Ah, oh, wretched man, would I had died a maid, and never seen thee, never borne thee, son, seeing thou hast proved so unnatural a father. Hath he deserved to lose his birthright thus? Father, you cannot disinherit me. If you be king, why should not I succeed? Pardon me, Margaret, pardon me, sweet son. The Countess Warwick and the Duke enforced me. Enforced thee? Art thou king, and wilt be forced? I shame to hear thee speak. Ah, oh, timorous wretch. Thou hast undone thyself, thy son, and me. The duke is made protector of the realm, and yet shalt thou be safe. Such safety finds the trembling lamb environed with wolves. Had I been there, which am a silly woman, 
The soldiers should have tossed me on their pikes before I would have granted to that act. But thou preferst thy life before thine honor, and seeing thou dost, I here divorce myself, both from thy table, Henry, and thy bed, until that act of parliament be repealed, whereby my son is disinherited. The northern lords that have forsworn thy colors will follow mine if once they see them spread, and spread they shall be to thy foul disgrace and utter ruin of the house of York. Thus do I leave thee. Come, son, let's away. Our army is ready. Come, we'll after them. Stay, gentle Margaret, and hear me speak. Thou hast spoke too much already. Get thee gone. Gentle son Edward, thou wilt stay with me. No! to be murdered by his enemies. When I return with victory from the field, I'll see your grace. So then, I'll follow her. <sighs> Poor queen. How love to me and to her son hath made her break out into terms of rage. Revenged may she be on that hateful duke, whose haughty spirit, winged with desire, will cost my crown. And like an empty eagle, tire on the flesh of me and of my son. Queen Margaret, accompanied by Lady Clifford and Northumberland, heads north to raise an army. Warwick keeps King Henry in her custody and maintains control of London. Back home, the York family celebrates their rising fortune. Brother, though I be youngest, give me leave. No, I can better play the orator. Uh, I have reasons strong and forcible. How now, sons and brothers, at a strife? What is your quarrel? How began it first? No quarrel, but a slight contention. About what? About that which concerns your grace and us, the crown of England, father, which is yours. Mine, boy. Not till King Henry be dead. Your right depends not on his life or death. Now you are heir. Therefore, enjoy it now. We took an oath that he should quietly reign. But for a kingdom, any oath may be broken. I would break a thousand oaths to reign one year. No, God forbid your grace should be forsworn. I shall be if I claim by open war. I'll prove the contrary if you'll hear me speak. Thou canst not, son. It is impossible. An oath! is of no moment, being not took before a true and lawful magistrate that hath authority over him that swears. Henry had none, but did usurp the place. Then seeing t'was he that made you to depose, your oath, my lord, is vain and frivolous. Therefore, to arms! And father, do but think how sweet a thing it is to wear a crown, within whose circuit is Elysium, and all that poets feign of bliss and joy. Why do we linger thus? I cannot rest until the white rose that I wear be dyed even in the lukewarm blood of Henry's heart. Richard, enough. I will be king or die. <laughs> Son George, thou shalt to London presently and whet on Warwick to this enterprise. Thou, Richard, shalt to the Duke of Norfolk and tell him privily of our intent. You, Edward, shall unto my lord Cobham, with whom the Kentishman will willingly rise. While you are thus employed, what resteth more but that I seek occasion how to rise? And yet the king not privy to my drift, nor any of the house of Lancaster. But stay, what news? Why comest thou in such post? The queen, with all the northern earls and lords, intend here to besiege you in your castle. She is hard by with twenty thousand troops, and therefore uh, fortify your hold, my lord. Aye, with my sword. What, thinkst thou that we fear them? Edward and Richard, you shall stay with me. We shall not need. We'll meet her in the field. What, with five thousand troops? Aye, with five hundred, father, for a need. A woman's general. What should we fear? <laughs> <laughs> They hear their drums. Let's set our guard in order and issue forth and bid them battle straight. Five men to twenty. Though the odds be great, I doubt not, my sons, of our victory. York's forces meet Margaret's army at Wakefield. After an hour of fighting, the Yorkists are hemmed in on all sides, and York's youngest son flees the battle. Oh, whither shall I fly to escape their hands? A tutor. Look where bloody Clifford comes. Chaplain, away! Thy priesthood saves thy life. As for the brat of this accursed duke whose father slew my father, he shall die. And I, lady, will bear him company. Soldiers, away with him! Ah! Clifford! Murder not this innocent child, lest thou be hated both of God and man! Ah, gentle Clifford, kill me with thy sword and not with such a cruel, threatening look. Sweet Clifford, hear me speak before I die. I am too mean a subject for thy wrath. Be thou revenged on men, and let me live. In vain thou speak'st, poor boy. My father's blood hath stopped the passage where thy words should enter. Then let my father's blood open it again, 
He is a man, and Clifford, cope with him. Had I thy brethren here, their lives and thine were not revenge sufficient for me. No, if I digged up thy forefathers' graves and hung their rotten coffins up in chains, it could not slake mine iron nor ease my heart. The sight of any of the house of York is as a fury to torment my soul until I root out their accursed line and leave not one alive. I live in hell. Therefore... Oh, let me pray before I take my death. To thee I pray, sweet Clifford. Pity me. Such pity as my rapier's point affords. Oh, let me live in prison all my days. And when I give occasion of offense, then let me die. For now thou hast no cause. No cause? Thy father... Slew my father, therefore die! <laughs> Plantagenet. I come, Plantagenet, and this Thy son's blood cleaving to my blade shall rust upon my weapon, till thy blood congealed with this do make me wipe off both. The army of the queen hath got the field, and all my followers to the eager foe turn back and fly like ships before the wind. My sons, God knows what hath perchanced them, but this I know, they have behaved themselves like men born to renown by life or death. Hark, the fatal followers do pursue, and I am faint and cannot fly their fury. And were I strong, I would not shun their fury. The sands are numbered that makes up my life. Here must I stay, and here my life must end. Come, bloody Clifford, rough Northumberland, I dare your quenchless fury to more rage. My ashes as the phoenix may bring forth a bird that will revenge upon you all. And in that hope I throw mine eyes to heaven, scorning whate'er you can afflict me with. I will not bandy with thee word for word, but buckler with thee blows twice two for one. (laughs) 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 Valiant Clifford, for a thousand causes I would prolong a while the traitor's life. (sighs) What would your grace have done unto him now? Come. Make him stand upon this molehill here. (laughs) What, was it you that would be England's king? Was it you that reveled in our parliament and made a preachment of your high descent? Where are your mess of sons to back you now? The wanton Edward? And the lusty George? And where's that valiant crookback prodigy? Dicky, your boy, that with his grumbling voice was wont to cheer his dad in mutinies? Or with the rest, where is your darling Rutland? Look, York, I stained this napkin with the blood that valiant Clifford with her rapier's point made issue from the bosom of the boy. And if thine eyes can water for his death, I give thee this! to dry thy cheeks with all. <laughs> I prithee grieve to make me merry, York. <laughs> Why art thou patient, man? Thou shouldst be mad, and I to make thee mad to mock thee thus. Stamp, rave, and fret, that I may sing and dance. Thou wouldst be feed, I see, to make me sport. Oh, York cannot speak unless he wear a crown. A crown for York! And lords bow low to him. Hold you his hands whilst I do set it on. (laughs) Aye, Mary, sir, now looks he like a king. Aye, this is he that took King Henry's chair. And this is he was his adopted heir. But how is it that great Plantagenet is crowned so soon and broke his solemn oath? As I bethink me, you should not be king till our King Henry had shook hands with death. And will you pale your head in Henry's glory and rob his temples of the diadem now in his life 
against your holy oath? Oh, tis a fault, too, too unpardonable. Off with the crown, and with the crown his head, and whilst we breathe, take time to do him dead. That is my office, for my father's sake. Nay, stay! Let's hear the orisons he makes. <laughs> She-wolf of France, but worse than wolves of France, whose tongue more poisons than the adder's tooth. How ill-beseeming is it in thy sex to triumph like an Amazonian trull upon their woes whom fortune captivates. But that thy face is visard-like unchanging, made impudent with use of evil deeds, I would assay, proud queen, to make thee blush. To tell thee whence thou camest, of whom derived, were shame enough to shame thee, wert thou not shameless. Thy father bears the title King of Naples, of both the Sicils and Jerusalem, yet not so wealthy as an English yeoman. Hath that poor monarch taught thee to insult? Tis beauty that doth oft make women proud, but God he knows thy share thereof is small. Tis virtue that doth make them most admired, the contrary doth make thee wondered at. Tis government that makes them seem divine. The want thereof makes thee abominable. O oh, tiger's heart wrapped in a woman's hide! How couldst thou drain the lifeblood of the child to bid the father wipe his eyes with all and yet be seen to bear a woman's face? Women are soft, mild, pitiful, and flexible. Thou, stern, obdurate, flinty, rough, remorseless, bidst thou me rage? Why, now thou hast thy wish! Wouldst have me weep? Why, now thou hast thy will! These tears are my sweet Rutland's obsequies, and every drop cries vengeance for his death against thee, Phil Clifford, and thee, false Frenchwoman. See, ruthless queen, a hapless father's tears. This cloth, thou dipst in blood of my sweet boy, and I with tears do wash the blood away. Keep thou the napkin, and go boast of this. And if thou tell'st the heavy story right upon my soul, the hearers will shed tears. Yea, my foes will shed fast falling tears and say, Alas, it was a piteous deed. There, take the crown, and with the crown my curse. And in thy need such comfort come to thee, as now I reap at thy too cruel hand. <coughs> Hard-hearted Clifford, Take me from the world, my soul to heaven, my blood upon your heads. Had he been slaughterman to all my kin, I should not for my life but weep with him to see how inly sorrow grips his soul. What weeping ripe, my lord Northumberland? Think but upon the wrong he did us all, and that will quickly dry thy melting tears. Here's for my oath. Here's for my father's death. <laughs> And here's to right our gentle-hearted king. <laughs> Open thy gate of mercy, gracious God. My soul flies through these wounds to seek out thee. <gasps> Off with his head and set it on York gates, so York may overlook the town of York. <laughs> After her victory at Wakefield, Queen Margaret takes her troops south to give chase to Warwick. York's remaining sons, having scattered after the battle, reassemble their troops. I wonder how our princely father scaped, or whether he be scaped away or no from Clifford's and Northumberland's pursuit. Affairs, my brother. Why is he so sad? I cannot joy until I be resolved where our right valiant father has become. I saw him in the battle range about as doth a lion in a herd of neat. Or as a bear, encompassed round with dogs, who having pinched a few and made them cry, the rest stand all aloof and bark at him. So fared our father with his enemies. So fled his enemies, my warlike father. Methinks tis prize enough to be his son. See how the morning opes her golden gates and takes her farewell of the glorious sun. Dazzle mine eyes, or do I see three suns? Three Glorious sons, each one a perfect son. See, see, they join, embrace, and seem to kiss as if they vowed some league inviolable. 
Now are they but one lamp, one light, one sun. In this the heaven figures some event. Tis wondrous strange, the like yet never heard of. I think it cites us, brother, to the field, mm. that we, the sons of brave Plantagenet, each one already blazing by our worth, should notwithstanding join our lights together and overshine the earth as this the world. <sighs> But what art thou, whose heavy looks foretell some dreadful story hanging on thy tongue? Uh, one that was a woeful looker-on, when as the noble Duke of York was slain, your princely father and my loving lord. Uh, speak no more! For I have heard too much. Say how he died, for I will hear it all. By many hands your father was subdued but only slaughtered by the ireful arm of unrelenting Clifford and the Queen, who crowned the gracious Duke in high despite, laughed in his face, and when with grief he wept, the ruthless Queen gave him to dry his cheeks, a napkin steeped in the harmless blood of sweet young Rutland, Rutland? by rough Clifford <gasps> slain. No! And after many scorns, many foul taunts, they took his head, and on the gates of York they set the same, and there it doth remain the saddest spectacle that e'er I viewed. Sweet Duke of York, our prop to lean upon. Now thou art gone, we have no staff, no stay. Oh, Clifford, boisterous Clifford, thou hast slain the flower of Europe for his chivalry. And treacherously hast thou vanquished him, for hand to hand he would have vanquished thee. Now my soul's palace is become a prison. For never henceforth shall I joy again, never. Oh, never shall I see more joy. I cannot weep, for all my body's moisture scarce serves to quench my furnace burning heart. Richard, I bear thy name. I'll avenge thy death, or die renowned by attempting it. His name that valiant duke hath left with thee. His dukedom and his chair with me Nay. is left. If thou be that princely eagle's bird, show thy descent by gazing against the sun. For chair and dukedom, throne and kingdom, say, either that is thine, or else thou wert not his. How now, fair lords, what fair, what news abroad? Great Lady Warwick, if we should recount our baleful news, and at each word's deliverance stab poniards in our flesh till all were told, the words would add more anguish than the wounds. Oh, valiant Warwick, the Duke of York is slain. Oh, Warwick! Warwick! That Plantagenet which held thee dearly as his soul's redemption is by the stern young Clifford done to death. Ten days ago, I drowned these news in tears. And now, to add more measure to your woes, I come to tell you things sith then befallen. After the bloody fray at Wakefield fought, where your brave father breathed his latest gasp, I, then in London, keeper of the king, marched toward St. Albans to intercept the queen, bearing the king in my behalf along. Short tale to make, we at St. Albans met, our battles joined, and both sides fiercely fought. But whether it was the coldness of the king, who looked full gently on his warlike queen, that robbed my soldiers of their heated spleen, or whether it was report of her success, or more than common fear of Clifford's rigor, I cannot judge. They had no heart to fight, and we in them no hope to win the day, so that we fled. The king unto the queen, and I, post haste, am come to join with you. Twas odds be like when valiant Warwick fled. Oft have I heard her praises in pursuit, but ne'er till now her scandal of retire. Nor now, my scandal, Richard, dost thou hear? For thou shalt know this strong right hand of mine can pluck the diadem from faint Henry's head and wring the awful scepter from his fist, were he as famous and as bold in war as he is famed for mildness, peace, and prayer. I know it well, Lady Warwick. Blame me not. But... In this troublous time, what's to be done? Shall we go throw away our coats of steel and wrap our bodies in black morning gowns? Or shall we on the helmets of our foes tell our devotion with revengeful arms? If for the last, say I and to it, lords! Aye. Why, therefore Warwick came to seek you out. Attend me, lords. The proud insulting queen has wrought the easy-melting king like wax. 
he swore consent to your succession. And now to London all her crew are gone to frustrate both his oath and what beside may make against the house of Lancaster. So via to London will we march, and once again cry charge upon our foes, but never once again turn back and fly. I now, methinks I hear great Warwick speak. Ne'er may one live to see a sunshine day that cries retire if Warwick bid them stay. Good Warwick, on thy shoulder will I lean, and when thou failst, as God forbid the hour, must Edward fall, which peril heaven forfend. No longer Earl of March, but Duke of York. The next degree is England's royal throne. Mm. For king of England shalt thou be proclaimed in every borough as we pass along, and they that throw not up their cap for joy shall for the fault make forfeit of their head. Then Clifford, were thy heart as hard as steel, as thou hast shown it plenty by thy deeds, I come to pierce it. Or to give thee mine. Then strike up drums. God and St. George for us. York. York! 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 Reinvigorated, York's sons and Warwick pursue the Queen's army. With Henry and Margaret reunited, the Lancastrians are once more in control of the government. Welcome, my lord, to this brave town of York. Yonder's the head of that arch enemy that sought to be encompassed with your crown. Does not the object cheer your heart, my lord? Aye, as the rocks cheer them that fear their wrack. To see this sight, it irks my very soul. Withhold revenge, dear God. Tis not my fault, nor wittingly have I infringed my vow. My gracious liege, this too much lenity and harmful pity must be laid aside. To whom do lions cast their gentle looks? Not to the beast that would usurp their den. Ambitious York did level at thy crown. He but a duke would have his son a king and raise his issue like a loving sire. Thou, being a king, blessed with a goodly son, didst yield consent to disinherit him. Were it not pity that this goodly boy should lose his birthright by his father's fault, and long hereafter say unto his child what my great-grandfather and grandsire got, my careless father fondly gave away. Oh, what a shame were this! Look on the boy! And let his manly face, which promiseth successful fortune, steal thy melting heart to hold thine own and leave thine own with him. Full well hath Clifford played the orator, inferring arguments of mighty force. But Clifford, tell me, didst thou never hear that things ill got had ever bad success? I'll leave my son my virtuous deeds behind, and would my father had left me no more. For all the rest is held at such a rate as brings a thousandfold more care to keep than in possession any jot of pleasure. Ah, oh, Cousin York, would thy best friends did know how it doth grieve me that thy head is here! My lord, cheer up your spirits. Our foes are nigh, and this soft courage makes your followers faint. You promised knighthood to our forward son. Unsheathe your sword and dub him presently. Edward, kneel down. Edward Plantagenet, arise a knight. And learn this lesson. Draw thy sword in right. My gracious father, by your kingly leave, I'll draw it as a parent to the crown, and in that quarrel, use it to the death. Why, that is spoken like a toward prince. Royal commanders, be in readiness. For with a band of thirty thousand strong comes Warwick, backing of the Duke of York, and in the towns as they do march along, proclaims him king, and many fly to him. Array your battle, for they are at hand. I would your highness would depart the field. The queen hath best success when you are absent. Aye, good my lord, and leave us to our fortune. Why, that's my fortune too, therefore I'll stay. Be it with resolution, then, to fight? My royal father, cheer these noble lords and hearten those that fight in your defense. Unsheath your sword, good father. Cry St. George! St. George! St. George! Now, perjured Henry, wilt thou kneel for grace and set thy diadem upon my head or bide the mortal fortune of the field? Go wait, I... thy minions, proud, insulting boy. 
becomes it thee to be thus bold in terms before thy sovereign and thy lawful king? I am his king, and he should bow his knee. I was adopted heir by his consent, since when his oath is broke. For as I hear, you that are king, though he do wear the crown, have caused him by new act of parliament to blot out me and put his own son in. And reason, too. Who should succeed the father but the son? Are you there, Butcher, oh, I cannot speak. I, crook back, here I stand to answer thee, or any he the proudest of thy sort. Twas you that killed young Rutland, was it not? I and old York, and yet not satisfied. For God's sake, lords, give signal to the fight. What sayest thou, Henry? Wilt thou yield the crown? Why, Wilt. how now, long-tongued Warwick, dare you speak? When you and I met at St. Albans last, your legs did better service than your hands. Then twas my turn to fly, and now tis thine. You said so much before, and yet you fled. Break off the parley, for scarce I can refrain the execution of my big swollen heart upon that Clifford, that cruel child killer! Have done with words, my lords, and hear me speak! Defy them, then, or else hold close thy lips. I prithee, give no limits to my tongue. I am a king. And privileged to speak. My liege, the wound that bred this meeting here cannot be cured by words. Therefore, be still. Say, Henry, shall I have my right or no? A thousand troops have broke their fasts today that ne'er shall dine unless thou yield the crown. If thou deny their blood upon thy head, for York in justice puts his armor on. If that be right which Warwick says is right, there is no wrong, but everything is right. Whoever got thee, there thy mother stands, for well I know thou hast thy mother's tongue. But thou art neither like thy sire nor dam, but like a foul, misshapen stigmatic, marked by the destinies to be avoided, as venom toads or lizards' dreadful stings. <laughs> Iron of Naples, hid with English guilt, shamest thou not? Knowing whence thou art extraught, to let thy tongue detect thy base-born heart? A wisp of straw were worth a thousand crowns to make this shameless callot know herself. Helen of Greece was fairer far than thou, although thy husband may be Menelaus. And ne'er was Agamemnon's brother wronged by that false woman, as this king by thee. His father reveled in the heart of France, and had he matched according to his state, he might have kept that glory to this day. But when he took a beggar to his bed, e'en then that sunshine brewed a shower for him that washed his father's fortunes forth of France and heaped sedition on his crown at home. For what hath broached this tumult but thy pride? Hadst thou been meek, our title still had slept. But when we saw our sunshine made thy spring, and that thy summer bred us no increase, we set the axe to thy usurping root. And know thou, since we have begun to strike, We'll never leave till we have hewn thee down. And in this resolution I defy thee, not willing any longer conference, since thou deniest the gentle king to speak. Sound trumpets, and let our bloody colors wave, and either victory or else a grave. Stay, Edward! No! Wrangling woman will no longer stay. These words will cost 10,000 lives this day. The two armies engage near Towton. The dispute has grown beyond the nobility, as soldiers from not only England, but also Wales, Scotland, and France join the two sides. In the first engagement, the Lancastrians get the upper hand. How now, my lord? What hap? What hope of good? Our hap is loss, our hope but sad despair. Our ranks are broke, and ruin follows us. What counsel give you? Whither shall we fly? Bootless is flight. They follow us with wings, and weak we are, and cannot shun pursuit. <sighs> ah, Warwick! Why hast thou withdrawn thyself? Thy brother's blood! The thirsty earth hath drunk, broached with the steely point of Clifford's lance! Oh, then let the earth be drunken with our blood! Here on my knee I vow to God above, I'll never pause again, never stand still, till either death hath closed these eyes of mine, or fortune given me measure of revenge! Oh, Warwick. I do bend my knee with thine, and in this vow do chain my soul to thine, thou set her up and pluck her down of kings. Vouchsafe a gentle victory to us, or let us die before we lose the day. Yet let us all together to our troops, and give them leave to fly that will not stay, and call them pillars that will stand to us. Come, come, away, and stand not to debate, for yet is hope of fortune good enough. Away, away, once more, sweet lords, farewell. York! 
Now, Clifford, I have singled thee alone. Suppose this arm is for the Duke of York, and this for Rutland, both bound to revenge! Now, Richard, I am here with thee alone. This is the hand that stabbed thy father, York. And this, the hand that slew thy brother, Rutland. And here's the heart that triumphs in their death, and cheers these hands that slew thy sire and brother to execute the like upon thyself. Nay, Warwick, single out some other chase, for I myself will hunt this wolf to death. <laughs> This battle fares like to the morning's war, when dying clouds contend with growing light. What time the shepherd, blowing of his nails, can neither call it perfect day nor night. Now sways it this way, like a mighty sea, forced by the tide to combat with the wind. Now sways it that way, like the selfsame sea, forced to retire by fury of the wind. Sometime the flood prevails, and then the wind. Now one the better, then another best, both tugging to be victors breast to breast. Yet neither conqueror nor conquered. So is the equal poise of this fell war. Here on this molehill will I sit me down. To whom God will, there be the victory. For Margaret, my queen, and Clifford too, have chid me from the battle, swearing both they prosper best of all when I am thence. Would I were dead, if God's good will were so. For what is in this world but grief and woe? O oh God, methinks it were a happy life to be no better than a homely swain, to sit upon a hill as I do now, to carve out dials quaintly, point by point. So many hours must I tend my flock. So many hours must I take my rest. So many hours must I contemplate. So many hours must I sport myself. So many days my ewes have been with young. So many weeks ere the poor fools will e'en. So many years ere I shall shear the fleece. So minutes, hours, days, weeks, months, and years passed over to the end they were created would bring white hairs unto a quiet grave. Ah, what a life were this! How sweet, how lovely! Gives not the hawthorn bush a sweeter shade to shepherds looking on their silly sheep than doth a rich embroidered canopy to kings that fear their subjects' treachery? Oh, yes, it doth. A thousandfold it doth. And to conclude, the shepherd's homely curds, his cold, thin drink out of his leather bottle, his wanted sleep under a fresh tree's shade, all which secure and sweetly he enjoys, is far beyond a prince's delicates. His viands sparkling in a golden cup, his body couched in a curious bed, when care, mistrust, and treason waits on him. Ill blows the wind that profits nobody. This man, whom hand to hand I slew in fight, may be possessed with some store of crowns. And I, that haply take them from him now, may yet, ere night, yield both my life and them to some man else, as this dead man doth me. Oh. Who's this? Oh God, it is my father's face, whom in this conflict I unwares have killed. Oh, heavy times begetting such events. 
From London by the king was I pressed forth. My father, being the Countess Warwick's man, came on the part of York, pressed by his captain. And I, who at his hands received my life, have by my hands of life bereaved him. Pardon me, God, I knew not what I did. And pardon, Father, for I knew not thee. My tears shall wipe away these bloody marks, and no more words till they have flowed their fill. O oh, piteous spectacle, O oh, bloody times, whilst lions war and battle for their dens, poor harmless lambs abide their enmity. Weep, wretched child, I'll aid thee tear for tear. Thou that so stoutly hath resisted me, give me thy gold, if thou hast any gold, for I have bought it with an hundred blows. But let me see, is this our foeman's face? Ah. Uh, no. No. No! It is mine only son! Oh, boy! If any life be left in thee, throw up thine eye. See, see what showers arise, blown with the windy tempest of my heart upon thy wounds that kills mine eye and heart. Oh, pity God this miserable age! What stratagems, how fell, how butcherly, erroneous, mutinous, and unnatural this deadly quarrel daily doth beget. Oh, boy, thy father gave thee life too soon, and hath bereft thee of thy life too late. Woe above woe, grief more than common grief. Oh, that my death would stay these ruthful deeds. Oh, pity, pity, gentle heaven, pity. Was ever son so rude a father's death? Was ever father so bemoaned his son? Was ever king so grieved for subjects' woe? I'll bear thee hence, where I may weep my fill. These arms of mine shall be thy winding sheet. My heart, sweet boy, shall be thy sepulchre. I'll bear thee hence, and let them fight that will, for I have murdered where I should not kill. Sad-hearted men, much overgone with care. Here sits a king. More woeful than you are. Fly, father! Fly, for all your friends are fled, and Warwick rages like a chafed bull. Away, for death doth hold us in pursuit! Mount you, my lord, towards Barrack post amain. Edward and Richard, like a brace of greyhounds, are at our backs, and therefore hence amain! Away, for vengeance comes along with them. Nay, stay not to expostulate, make speed, or else come after all away before. Nay, take me with thee, good Northumberland. Not that I fear to stay, but... Love to go, whither the queen intends. Forward, away! At Towton, thousands of soldiers die in hand-to-hand -hand combat. The nearby river fills with the bodies of the dead. It is the bloodiest battle ever fought on English soil. Edward orders his troops to kill any surrendering members of the peerage rather than hold them for ransom. Near the end of the battle, a deadly arrow pierces Clifford in the neck. Here burns my candle out. Ay, here it dies. No way to fly. No strength to hold out flight, which whiles it lasted gave King Henry light. Oh, Lancaster, I fear thy overthrow more than my body's parting with my soul. My love and fear glued many friends to thee. And now I fall. Thy tough commixture melts, impairing Henry, strengthening misproud York. The common people swarm like summer flies, and whither fly the gnats but to the sun? And who shines now but Henry's enemies? Bootless are plaints, and cureless are my wounds. The foe is merciless and will not pity, for at their hands... I have deserved no pity. Come, York and Richard, Warwick and the rest. I stabbed your father's bosoms. Split my breast. Now, breathe we, lords. Good fortune bids us pause and smooth the frowns of war <laughs> with peaceful looks. Whose soul is that which takes their heavy leave? See who it is. And now the battle's ended. If friend or foe, let them be gently used. Uh -huh. 
Ah, oh, revoke that doom of mercy, for tis Clifford, who not contended that she lobbed the branch in hewing Rutland when his leaves put forth, but set her murdering knife unto the root from whence that tender spray did sweetly spring. I mean our princely father, Duke of York. Now death shall stop her dismal threatening sound. And her ill-boding tongue no more shall speak. Dark, cloudy death o'ershades her beams of life, and she nor sees nor hears us what we say. Oh, would she did. And so, perhaps, she doth. <laughs> Tis but her policy to counterfeit, because she would avoid such bitter taunts which in the time of death she gave our father. If so thou thinkst. Vex her with eager words. <laughs> <laughs> Clifford! Ask mercy and obtain no grace. Clifford! Repent in bootless penitence. Clifford! Devise excuses for thy faults. <laughs> we devise fell tortures for thy faults. <laughs> Thou didst love York, and I am son to York. <laughs> Thou pitiest Rutland, I will Pity thee. Where's Captain Margaret to fence you now? They mock thee, Clifford. Swear as thou wast wrong. What? Not an oath? <laughs> Nay, then the world goes hard when Clifford cannot spare her friends an oath. Oh. <laughs> I know by that she's dead. And by my soul, if this right hand would buy but two hours' life that I, in all despite, might rail at her, this hand should chop it off and with the issuing blood stifle the villain whose unstaunched thirst York and young Rutland could not satisfy. Aye, aye, but she's dead. <sighs> off with the traitor's head and rear it in the place your father's stands. And now to London with triumphant march, there to be crowned England's royal king. <laughs> From whence shall Warwick cut the sea to France and ask the Lady Bona for thy queen? <laughs> so shalt thou sinew both these lands together, and having France thy friend, thou shalt not dread the scattered foe that hopes to rise again. Even as thou wilt, sweet Warwick, let it be. For in thy shoulder do I build my seat, <laughs> and never will I undertake the thing wherein thy counsel and consent is wanting. <laughs> Richard, I will create thee Duke of Gloucester and George of Clarence. <laughs> Warwick as ourself shall do and undo as her pleaseth best. Uh, uh, let me be Duke of Clarence, George of Gloucester, for Gloucester's dukedom is too ominous. <laughs> That's a <laughs> foolish observation. Richard, be Duke of Gloucester. Now to London to see these honors in possession. York! 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 <laughs> You've been listening to Shakespeare's History Season 2, The Queen's Storm, presented by Brave Spirits Theatre, directed by Charlene V. Smith. This recording is produced and edited by Patrick Flynn. <laughs>